Don't miss our very first tips and tactics that you need to know about Warhammer 40k 8th edition. Spiky bits. What's up Hobby Maniacs? Rob Bear checking in with you today talking some 8th edition. Man oh man, this is it. This 12 little pages of rules has caused such a ruckus. Well, I guess maybe the data sheets have too out there that it's uh I wanted to weigh in. I've been literally studying these rules the best I've been able to throughout all the different coverage and such we've been doing over on Spiky Bits. And I wanted to start a series of, you know, the 10 things that you need to know about 40K. And as I started going through and started writing up my outline of what I wanted to talk about, I realized that I had only gotten through basically a psychic phase. And that's only the, the second bullet point on the rules themselves. And let me give you a couple of quick uh, pieces of advice. First off, I've, I've, I've been very fortunate to have learned the Age of Sigmar rules, which were only four pages and be able to apply to basically suspend the uh, the disbelief of what I thought I knew about how to play war games with Age of Sigmar because that was that was really step number one was read everything for what it says and not what you think it says and that couldn't be more true in 40k now there again there's only 12 official pages of rules thus far in 40k not not counting all the match play and you know uh, narrative plays which we're not even going to cover we're basically just going to go over the core rules and match play stuff and then the basic 12 pages of rules but you really need to suspend that disbelief like me unfortunately i've been doing this for 30 years i've, been, I've played every edition of the game thus far that's been out uh for warhammer so i've got 30 years worth of editions in my brain pan rolling around so it's it's a little bit harder for me and you know somebody on the stream was saying the other day they're like well you know when i go to the game store i'm gonna get somebody that's brand new to explain the game to me and i was like you know what that is an excellent idea because those folks don't have any predetermined or preconceived ideas about this game at this point because they are brand new to it so they're they're literally reading it how we should be reading it for what it says and not what we think it says so if you can kind of suspend Spend the disbelief and read these rules with an open mind, it will definitely behoove you and add to your uh, comprehension and understanding of the game itself. Now, this is brand new and it is challenging. It is only 12 pages, but I think uh, we can get it through it together. Now, this is probably just going to be a part one because like I said, I got, I only got to right here and I was already at the point where, well, that was 10 things and that's probably going to take me, you know, half an hour or so to talk about because I've, I've done this enough. We've done it with all of fifth edition, all sixth edition, all seventh edition, you know, going over the rule books, all these tips and tactics. So I know how long it's going to take us to talk about stuff and, you know, really boil it down and get it to the point of comprehension to where we can all come away with something that we did need to know about the particular content in question, right? So first off, let's go over a couple universal truths about match play itself. So we're gonna kind of put a pause on the core rules and start building up that foundation for 8th edition 40K. So we're gonna start here in the fighting the battle section. Now Only War, I love this, this mission here, but this really isn't for what a lot of ma match play is gonna be happening. This is a great starter mission here, so if you're starting up the, the game or just wanna get in something quick, that might be a good option for you, but we're just gonna kinda of skip, pretend this doesn't exist, but it's definitely not worth ignoring either if you're a new player or if you just wanna do a pickup game or do a demo game with somebody and not get, not get them too confused about how the game itself plays. So we're gonna start with fighting the battle, and this is universal for every match play game out there. Every match play game, gets a warlord, you get to choose a warlord, and you also get to choose right now, at least in the competitive scene, we don't know 100% how it's all gonna go, but I assume that is gonna be the case, whether it's ATC or ITC, ATC, or you know, games at your local store, ETCs over in Europe, I don't know. But right now, we know that you will get a warlord, and you will be able to pick from any one of these three warlord traits, which are all fantastic, um, plus one attacks for your warlord, or you can give plus one leadership to all friendly units within six inches of this warlord and that actually helps out with the detachment restrictions or you, your warlord basically gets a foe feel no pain on a six shreds off damage and does not have to lose any wounds he actually takes those are very good right there i've, I've ran a bunch of guard games every time i make past my war, my warlord and i'm getting a feel uh you know a six up basic feel no pain off that and it's uh it's contributed to his survival definitely so don't don't forget any of those right there now from here we jump over this is kind of a five part thing for our, for our first number one of the <laughs> top 10 things you need to know about the new 40k how to choose your army so we're 
fighting a battle. We've got our warlord. We're choosing our army now. The army faction. All units in a match play army, with the exception of those that are on our line, must have at least one faction keyword in common, even though they may be in different detachments. Now we talked, we touched on some of this briefly in some of the faction uh, breakdowns we did for the index books. Now here, all that means is basically, if you have a match play army, you have several detachments which make up a battle forged army, which we all know at this point, right? they all have to have the same keyword and that can be Imperium, that can be Chaos, that can be Xenos, that could all be Space Marines, whatever. Whatever it is, they all have to be, this, they all have to share the same keyword. So that's how you're not going to get, you know, like Tau in with Imperium because you can't do that. You literally cannot do that in your army. But you can do, you could have Xenos and have Eldar, have Necrons, have Orcs stuff like that so you see how you're starting to bridge that gap there and what armies are technically battle brothers and you can't really go outside the whole battle brothers realm because your battle brothers are now a faction keyword is kind of what it's restricted to to borrow some seventh edition lingo there points limit and all the organized events everything down here you'll be able to see all that here in the near future but what you really need to focus on in my opinion um, and what a lot of people out there are going to focus on is eternal war missions and match play mission rules. So here we are. We've got our army. It's all the same faction. We've got a warlord. All right. Well, here's what we have to remember about match play. And these are the, these are the three universal truths about match play games. First off, with the exception of smite, each psychic power can only be attempted once per turn. Pretty simple. Very, very smart on Games Workshop's part, in my opinion. Strategic discipline. Now, this is gonna, we're gonna talk about this in one of our points here later on in this video. Each stratagem cannot be used by the same player more than once in any single phase. Remember, each player has their own turn, and each player turn comprises one battle round. So, a battle round is now the new name for a turn, and player turns are their individual turns. Just kind of keep that terminology in mind here. Now this does not affect stratagems that are not used during a phase, such as those before the battle begins or at the end of a battle round. So it almost seems like right there, and we're going to touch on this here in a minute, but I just want to get this visualization in your mind real quick about this one important point in my humble opinion is now on the battle round, you have individual phases to each player turn, but there's almost a check stop at the bottom and the top of the battle round where you, where it can be interrupted by abilities that say before the battle begins or at the end of a battle round itself and then you are allowed to use multiple stratagems you're also allowed to you know um you have to actually no player has a priority at that point so you have to kind of roll off according to some stuff we're going to cover later so keep that in mind right there strategic stratagems once per phase, except for at the top and bottom stops of a battle round. Tactical reserves. Uh, you have to set up at least half the total number of units in your army on the battlefield, even if you can keep them in reserve for whatever reason. So a little bit of departure on the past and a fundamental change to a lot of armies out there that may have worked a certain way in the past. So now we've got those three universal truths to match play that we have to keep in, keep in, keep in mind here. We've got new standard deployment maps, some stuff we hadn't seen in the past, some stuff we have seen in the past, uh, some old favorites and some old favorites, I, I suppose, and some new stuff right there, but some maybe uh, returning maps right there that used to be called cleanse back in the day. Now, jumping into eternal, oh, and the other universal pr uh, truth of match play, of course, is that if you lose, there's two sudden death checks. If you lose uh, the game, well, excuse me, of course, if you lose the game, if you lose all your models, if you have no models left besides a fortification, you lose the game. Also, if you forfeit, you lose the game and you give your opponent a crushing victory right there. So there's our universal truths of the new edition. Now, I'm not going to talk about the individual missions, but I do, now that we're kind of in the middle of talking about detachments, so we've got our army, we've got our warlord, we've got our universal truths. Battle Forged Armies. That's what everybody has to play in match play, right? Okay, so what is a Battle Forged Army? Well, a Battle Forged Army is simply put, an army that's put into detachments and can, is comprised entirely of neat little boxes of detachments, which are all listed right here over these two pages. Okay, 
there's various options available. We talked about this in the, the very first rulebook review we did here. We've got new slots of battlefield roles. One's called a flyer, one's called dedicated transport. Most of the major detachments here give you the ability to take a dedicated transport for each of the other units that are in here if you so desire. But some of the stuff back here, some of the auxiliary we'll call them uh, detachments, don't. Now here's the one thing you have to remember when you're doing a match play battle forged army. All of your units not only have to have you know the same faction but they all have to be in detachments and the biggest restriction to detachments is that each one all units must be from the same faction for the majority of these all the ones on this page all the ones on this page all the way up to right here every one of these has to be the same faction the same individual faction so that's not to say that you can't have a detachment of say Astra Militarum and a detachment of say space marines inside of an imperium army that is perfectly allowable but you can't have something like a tau detachment along with an imperial detachment because then you don't have a way to make what is your army faction at that point it doesn't exist it's not imperium it's not chaos it's not xenos so you have that problem right there these right here, you don't necessarily have to be the same faction to put them into your lit, uh, to put them into your uh, detachment here. So there is that. So you can you can kind of mix and match here a little willy nilly. Um, you could do some crazy stuff, I suppose, but there's going to be detractions. Like for instance, if you're just trying to throw in one of each here, you're going to lose a command point. Which some of these you're going to gain command points. Remember, you always start out with three command points. So that is a very important thing to remember. Uh, in a lot of cases, you'll get plus, you'll get extra command points. If you take, say, for instance, Gilliman or Creed, you get extra, extra command points. And I think this, the good place to be on command points is between five and eight. You want at least one for each player turn that you anticipate having, maybe something for a top or a bottom of a turn, or maybe if you have to do something, you know, maybe a shooting and then maybe an assault reroll or something like that. You know, saving rerolls for Gilliman, trying to get back up, etc., etc. So there's instances out there where you're gonna want command points, um, at least one per turn. But remember, counteroffensive and insane bravery both cost two command points right there. So five to eight, I feel like, is a good spot to be uh, to be very competitive and also um, still have the ability to be reactive and not always on the defensive. Okay, so now that we've talked about that. Um, that was kind of my number two points. Every army in match play, uh, you know, kind of has to be built a certain way. It has to be put, it has to have be the same faction. It has to be put into detachments and most detachments have to be from the same faction. Now there are, um, I guess things that will break that rule. Whereas like Gene Stiller cult has a special rule that says you, you can have Astro Militarum, you know, and Gene Stiller cult factions in the same Xenos list uh, there's things like that that allow it to happen but you gotta you gotta have that special rule so you're gonna have to read through all the data slates and check up on that okay we covered every army has the three command points in match play five to eight being the sweet spot now let's circle back for point number four and jump into the missions real quick so all of the eternal war missions well all six of them all follow the same format when it comes to who gets first turn and battle length. And these are two very important things to keep in consideration when you're building your list. First off, first turn uh, goes to the player who finished setting up their army first, can just choose to take first or second turn. If they decide to take the first turn, their opponent gets a chance to seize the initiative on a six, just like back in the day. And if, you know, again, hey, check this out. This is something that happens before the battle round. So you can burn, you know, your command points on that, obviously. Um, you can't force them to reroll, but they can definitely reroll if they don't get a six and they feel like they really need that six. They could, but you can never reroll a reroll. And we'll show you where that rule is here in a minute as well. But that being said, not only is it extremely effective and extremely useful at this point right here, because you get to dictate the terms of battle almost, be going first or second, but you also get a play on the battle length. Remember battle lengths, there used to be variable turn length, you'd start rolling at five, 
and you'd always be like, oh, no, you go ahead, man, you roll, or, you know, or whatever, something like that. Like, I never personally cared. Well, now you do need to care because you can re-roll these dice, remember? So, not only does it, not only do you have that ability, but it goes to the player who had the first turn to roll the d6. So, how strategic is that now? Based on who has the first turn, based on who chose it, perhaps, and, you know, five out of six times, because they had all their models down first, are going to get to make that roll. So do you roll it? And if you fail it, you want another turn, you re-roll it. The odds are good there, right? 66%. If you want the game to end and it goes on, well, why not burn and re-roll as well and try to, you know, end the game right there. If you're ahead, there's no shame in it. But it dictates the terms of battle, not only at the start, but also nearly a high percentage of the time at the end of battle. So it's very important that you get all your models down on the table first. Now, back in the day, that used to not be a problem, right? Because you could just be like, all right, well, all these guys are in the same detachment, I'm putting them all down. Well, that's not the case with, you know, uh, how you deploy right now. So remember, players alternate deploying their units one at a time, starting with the player who did not pick their deployment zone. So now, when you start to set up the game, depending on who won this role, you can look down at your, your models and you can be like, all right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. My opponent, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, uh, he won the role, he's gonna get to set up. Uh, crap, there's no way I can get down first. I'm already screwed at this point. So now this role might become more important than this role up here to get the first turn. You don't even get to the first turn point, or excuse me, you don't even get your stuff down. Now right here, you're like, holy crap. I need, to, I need to win this roll. I need to be spending command points from the get-go right here. So, what do you do in case you look down at the table and you have more units than your opponents? Wouldn't it behoove you perhaps to have a transport of some kind so that maybe these three units here you can put in this one unit here and now you're plus two units on the table. It may dictate where you put your models into a transport which may or may not be more vulnerable than they were originally but a little bit of vulnerability goes a long ways to securing the first turn and being able perhaps to dictate this last turn right here as well. So I think when you're building your list, people are like, oh, you know, I'm going to take all these characters and I'm going to take that. But hey, wouldn't it be a good idea maybe to have a transport in here, if not a land raider, maybe at least a rhino, maybe a drop pod, something, keep stuff in reserve, whatever, you know, that... It would, be, it would be very tactical to be able to do quick math in your head and figure out, okay, I need to put all this into these transports to set up on the table. Boom, okay, go ahead. Now I have the first turn. So these are the things that you're gonna have to consider right from the get-go when designing your army, not just to fit them all into these detachments to get X number of command points, but also to hopefully secure that first turn victory or first turn you know selection right off the bat right there these are all very important things in my opinion okay now let's talk about some movement let's jump back to the main rules here now that we've laid down that foundation that groundwork for your actual armies itself uh, let's talk about the core rules now of course we have all the phases pretty much everybody's in agreement on all of that Movement phase pretty much functions the same way it used to. Uh, coherency is two inches, vertically it's six inches, just like we saw in the past. You're gonna wanna pay very special attention to individual terrain data sheets. Things like ruins say that you know troops can squeeze through the windows, whereas you know vehicles and such have to drive around. You literally cannot drive a vehicle through a wall anymore, unless it's like a low hinge or hill or, or wall or something like that. There's a specific you know set of rules for it. I think it's in the back of the Imperium 2 book, I wanna say. But those are very important things uh, to keep in mind. Now on the movement phase, there's something called a minimum move. And a lot of people this uh, may not have realized this, but having a fly keyword is huge because it allows you to jump back out of combat, excuse me, perform a fallback maneuver or, a fallback maneuver or movement and still shoot and function semi-normally uh, than what you would. But there's also units that have fly that have the airborne special rule, and the airborne special rule gives you a minimum and a maximum movement. Remember, fly are set up on the table now, and they never go off. And if they go off, or they don't have a place to move to on the table because they cannot uh, physically position themselves because they're within one inch of an enemy, then they are destroyed. So you still kind of can 
catch that fly ball like you could back in the day when a flyer got immobilized and then it had to move like straight 18 inches and then you put a unit there and you're like, well, I guess your model crashed. My little my little squig killed your, uh, you know, killed your Necron flyer or whatever. And it's kind of the sad days, but it was what it was. Uh, that was an addition of, of yesteryear. But now where we are today, that sort of thing can still happen, but flyers have a little bit more ability to deal with it. First off, they can move over intervening models and also intervening terrain because most airborne units have the fly special rule. Some have an additional special rule that allow them to turn after they perform the move and turn and move again the old vector dancer special rule. So look out for some of that. Now, if a flyer does get assaulted, and I say flyer, so obviously I mean something with airborne, is assaulted by something that has the fly special rule because that's the only way I think it can happen currently, then technically they're locked in combat. But remember, you have to move your minimum distance according to this paragraph right here. So if you're a flyer, something like a storm raven gets assaulted by say a jump pack squad, that flyer has to still move when it's when it activates, when it's that player's turn, if that flyer, that storm raven does not move, it's destroyed. So it has the airborne ability, it has a fly ability, it can move right over stuff, it can keep on trucking, it just has the restriction on its movement, 90 degree pivots and such. So as long as you can place it, you're good to go. But you have to keep in mind that you do have to move that model its minimum move or it is destroyed. So a smart player could kind of get you with that, assault you and then spread out its backfield so it doesn't give you a place to go because he slows you down and then allows you know the rest of his models to kind of move into place. Could happen, but it's definitely something to be aware of right there. So airborne models and falling back using the fly keyword. You still get to function, which is pretty good, but you still have to be aware that I believe you still have to do that right there. Uh, also, advancing is now done in the movement phase. You only have to touch your model once if you want to uh, get a what used to be called the run move, which was done in the shooting phase. So you say, hey, this guy, he's going to advance. There's certain restrictions on that as well. Um, you can declare that any model will advance, roll a die, and add all the results and the movement characteristics. A unit that advances can't shoot or charge later in the turn. So it works still very similar to running which used to be during the shooting phase, but now you pick up your model once and you already know you've rolled the dice. So you say instead, well, five, maybe you got a three. So now you're moving in eight and you put it down. So you're touching your models less only twice um, if you decide to charge, but you couldn't charge unless you have an ability that allows you to charge after you advance. But at the, you know, at the minimum, you're only going to touch your models twice during a turn, most likely once during a turn instead of twice. So it's cutting down on a lot of play time, as you can imagine. Picking things up and moving things takes time out of your game when you can be having fun and engaging with your opponent, right? Um, on next point, point number eight, I think it is, is that the, the player turn sequence here. Now, there's a lot of stuff that uh, seems to elude to uh, a bit of sequencing, and that's all right here in the in the margins of the psyche phase. So sequency, you'll occasionally find that two or more rules can be resolved at the same time, normally at the start of the movement phase or before or after the battle begins. When this happens during the game, the player whose turn it is chooses the order. If these things occurred before or after the game or at the start or end of the battle round, the players roll off and the winner decides in what order the rules are resolved. So now what's that, that is also seems to allude to the point I made earlier, where it seems like they're making a stop check for actions at the top and the bottom of the battle round. So a battle round, you can stop, then it's a player turn A, or player turn one, which gets all of these phases, player turn two, which gets all these phases, and then it stops at the bottom of the battle round, for a universal check of sequencing. And that seems what it alludes to right here, which is a kind of a clear cut indicator that we didn't have the four and seventh edition. And then they give you some ideas. Remember we talked about stratagems. You are not limited to how many stratagems you can use at those two stop checkpoints. You are limited during each phase during your player turn, okay? Um, right, so, okay. Uh, roll offs too, if you have a sequencing issue during the beginning or end of a battle round, 
no player has priority. So you're gonna have to roll off for that right there, which is the other margin point right here, which I think is a very important distinction. And also how that works for your rerolls, because remember, you can use as many rerolls as, as you want, assuming it's not for the same dice roll, command point wise, and then right here is your reroll restrictions. You can only reroll a reroll once, regardless. So there it is, margin points coming in clutch right now. Now we're gonna skip over to uh, the perils of the warp in the psychic phase, because psychic pretty much works very similar to how it used to and, and how it does in Age of Sigmar. I'm sure everybody's on board with those points right now. But the mistakes I see a lot of um, people making online and already at game stores is perils of the warp. If you perils, you do not fail in your attempt to cast a spell unless your caster physically dies from taking the D3 damage um, to D3 mortal wounds right there. So keep that in mind too. If you roll the box cards, you roll the snake eyes, you're not automatically dispelling the spell, unless it's dispelled by your opponent, of course. Uh, it still goes off. You take your wounds, you pay your tax, and it goes off, and everything's right with the world. However, if you die, spells null and void, goes away, Psyker's dead, uh, easy peasy, lemon squeezy right there. But I see a lot of people messing that up, and it's easy to forget, because you're like, oh, I perils, I don't get it off. No, you do get it off, and there was always a question in 7th edition about that, so I'm glad that they rectified uh, that in this blurb right here, and they also talk about you resolve it, you always resolve it, as long as the Psyker did not die as a result of the perils of the warp or thwarted by a denied witch test right there. So there's our 10, there's our 10 points. 10 points, 10 things you need to know broken down in individual sections <laughs> uh, that you need to know about the new 40K. And we're only to the psychic phase right here. We still have point three, four, and five in the main rule book, but we've covered the majority of setting up your game. So that's kind of why it took a little long there. So we've got that foundation built now. We're up to the psychic phase. We're 30 minutes into this video, so you see what I'm saying? It's always good to have more material to cover in the future, in my opinion, than put it all in one long, boring, one hour to two hour video um, that, you know, may or may not get watched. I don't know. But thank you for watching this video. I hope that these 10 things you need to know about the new edition of 40K are helpful for you. Obviously, check back shortly for the rest of the series. I think we can hopefully finish out another 10 on the rest of the rules here this week uh, for, you know, right around the launch of the new edition of 40K. Now, if you like all of our features here on the channel, make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel. Turn on notifications so you can be the very first to like and comment on our video features here and head on over to the longwar.net that's the home of the battle reports for exclusive content early access videos and more and tons and tons and tons of eighth edition content and become a veteran of the long war today